of our Kingdom Gold series, and I'm calling this message Set Free to Be Holy, and we're going to be talking about how to live holy lives. As I was praying and thinking and literally sweating about what to bring to the message to you all, the Lord just kept whispering to me, holiness, 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 holiness. And I was just really vexed because I was like, Lord, can't we just do something smaller, more simple, more specific than an all-encompassing, life-altering thing like holiness? And he's like, you know, just be the clay. Uh, I'm the potter. Do what I say. And I was like, holiness it is. Thank you. So as much as I was prompted to speak on holiness, I found that it wasn't just holiness that I was I was supposed to speak about, but the Lord was actually telling me to speak on being holy, which really is our identities as believers of holiness. Now, holiness is of God. He alone is holy. Get that straight. Separate from God, we are useless piles of sinful flesh. Verse 2 in the ESV, everything's in the ESV, just so you know, says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in, in the splendor of his holiness. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Ephesians 4, 20 through 24 says, But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed to the spirit of your minds. Put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. We, as believers through Christ and the power of his Holy Spirit, now have access to his holiness. As I'm on this path and approach Jesus's perfection, his holiness, it's like a magnifying glass on my own sin. The closer I get to Jesus, the more my sin is magnified and is presented to me as an imperfect being. Jerry Bridges writes, as we, reproach, as we approach holiness seriously, we see that as moral perfection and infinite hatred of sin leaves us with, with utter dismay because of our lack of holiness. As we approach Jesus, we become more aware that we are not holy. To live holy is an expectant command. It's the way of a Christian's life. Jesus says, be holy, for I, the Lord, am holy. Christians are to live out holiness through our lives, to make it conspicuous, to make it obvious. And to understand holiness, we're going to look at the three identities of the believer and see a picture of the gospel through that and then we're going to take a look at a biblical principle for walking in our identity of holiness. So let's go. Identity number one, <clears throat> who we were created to be originally. We we're designed with a holy identity. Genesis 1.26 says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. We were made to be in relationship, perfect harmony with the Lord, with God himself. We were created holy. The second identity I want to look at is what we were born into, a fallen sinful identity. Adam sinned and broke that communion which translated <clears throat> and transferred a fallen skewed identity to the rest of man. Now man is born into a sinful reality. This is our current Reality, broken and separated from God with no opportunity in himself to reconcile. I know this seems really dark and, and, and destitute, but promise there's, there's, there's a bright side. 
Romans 5, 12 says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. That seed was transferred to all of us in humankind. Identity number three, who Christ redeems us to be, a redeemed holy identity. See, we started up here. God created us up here. We fell, almost like we're diving into the depths of the ocean, drowning, and we think that's reality. Then Christ comes and redeems us back through his blood, if we should so receive that gift, and pulls us back to the top where we're supposed to be. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Romans 8, 16 and 17 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit, the Holy Spirit, with our fleshly, our, our earthly spirit, that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we also might be glorified together. But how do we actually live this holiness out? We're redeemed back to a holy life. We're set apart by God himself, by, through the blood of Jesus. We're set apart. We're made holy, but we still have a responsibility. And if we look at Jesus, we can see how Jesus lived out holiness on the earth as an example and an opportunity for us to live out a holy life here on earth. Being holy is not just a position, it's a pursuit. Now the be do, I say be do because it's about being and out of the being with Jesus and being who Jesus has called us to be, we get to do, we get to act. Being in Jesus, being with Jesus and being who Jesus declares us to be is the essence of holiness. In fact, it's the transformative pursuit of God's holiness in our lives. Because being with God created, being who God created us to be and calls us into being is an invitation to live out our true identity as sons and daughters of the one true God. Let that sink in. Being holy is not just a position. He sets us apart. That's our position, but it's a pursuit to seek after his holiness day by day. Being with Jesus sets my example of holiness, to see his life, to experience his word, sets my example of how to live holy in this world. Being with Jesus strengthens me to battle against the flesh and walk in holiness. He gives me strength to fight my flesh. And being who Jesus has created me to be through his blood is to be actively holy. Now, holiness isn't merely an attribute. Holiness is an active constant in my life. Holiness, because of salvation, is my life's pursuit. God says, be holy, for I am holy. Now, the degree of holiness that I live out, that I access through the access that I have to God, is is up to me. It's up to you. How much of his holiness you live out in your life is up to you. We can either set, eat at the table, set before us, lavished with holiness, and grow, or we can stand afar off, looking at the buffet set before us of holiness, and starve. That makes us redeemed, but emaciated. It makes us empowered, yet languishing. See, are we set apart, but we're not eating at the table. We're not taking advantage, full advantage of who God has created us to be, where he has put us in access to his holiness. Since I am holy, righteous, redeemed, a son of God, then I am to comport my life in such a way that reflects and reveals his holiness, which I have complete open access to. We have access to the Father. We have access to all he has, all his giftings, all his power. We have 
unlimited access, unfettered access to that. And now the do, when we, when we understand who we are, the being, now we, out of that we do, we act. I'm drawn to do because of who he is, who he has created me to be. God's shown me this principle for living out holiness as identity. This is fresh, you guys. This is what's happening in my life right now. I'm opening up the scriptures and I'm just like being urged to live holy, to be holy. So, this is the beginning of our principles for living out holiness. Number one, we need to take ownership. And that's our holy responsibility. We need to take ownership of who we are in Christ, our access to holiness. We need to own that. Romans 6, 8 through 11 says, Now if we have died with Christ, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. And here it is right here. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You have to take responsibility for yourself, for your own self in Christ. 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11 ish says, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. Verse eight, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, we're given these things, but they need to be increasing, and that is up to you and I. Verse 10 says, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. God doesn't save us and leave us alone. He saves us and expects us to take advantage, full advantage, of who he is and who we are in him. I need to take responsibility for the holiness that I have access to. I need to take full ownership and responsibility for the state of my heart and emotions daily, hourly, second by second. I need to seek his heart. I need to draw near to him. I need to make him and being with him the priority of my life. My personal holiness is reflected in the amount of focus that I have on Jesus himself. A.W. Tozer writes, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What, do you th what are your thoughts about God? What are those thoughts? What are the thoughts about your own personal holiness? Are you taking responsibility for that? When I take ownership of the amount of holiness I reflect in my life, I actively pursue the heart of Jesus to work in and through all of me. I get to do that. He saves me, he sets me apart, he deems me holy, but then he gives me access. I need to take advantage of that. And I need to take responsibility for doing that in and of myself. Okay, number two. Number one was obey. I mean, one, number one was take ownership. Number two is deny. Deny yourself. And that's a holy rejection. In Matthew 16, 24, 25, we see, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life would lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Self-denial is imperative for holiness. 
Romans 6, 12 through 14 says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. That's an action that we have to take. It says, let not, don't let it do it to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you. God saved us from the, from the dominion of sin and death. He took us out of that. We are no longer in that kingdom. We can refuse sin where others who are not saved from that kingdom can't do that. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. G. Campbell Morgan writes, the consistent teaching of Christ himself and of his apostles is that when self is denied, Christ ascends to the throne, assumes the responsibility, and by his own indwelling through the Holy Spirit communicates all the power necessary for obedience. When we deny ourselves, Christ is able to fill up the cavity of our souls in order to work in and through us for obedience. With my everything in denial, Jesus is able to completely fill me up, directing me in all ways at all times towards holiness. Denial makes less of me and my wants and my needs and my affections and more of Jesus. It prioritizes Jesus over my affections of self. Unless I first deny, I can't obey. And take that into your heart today. Unless you deny what is against the holy of holies, you can't obey the Son of God. Which takes us to our next point. Number three, obey God. We've got to obey. First was ownership. Second was denial. And third is obey God. And that's our holy surrender. Romans 6, 15 through 19 says, What then, Paul says, are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are the slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience that leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to, to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. And the original word for sanctification there is the same word as holiness. Jesus calls us to obedience. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. In Mark, he says, Abba, Father, he cries out. He literally says, he models it for us in the garden. He calls out and he's like, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. He's about to face death and separation from him and the, the Holy Father. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Obedient unto death. That's our model. Our Savior is our model. A life of disobedience is a life of self-centeredness and a literal declaration of war against a holy God. A life of obedience is a life reflective of Jesus and empowered with the Holy Spirit in all holiness. All I do and all I act out in my life has the potential and the opportunity to be holy. 
if I take ownership of it, if I deny myself, if I am obedient to the word. Fourth point, it's the last precept. Number four, train yourself, holy discipline. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, Paul writes, do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Paul's saying, I need to train myself daily. I need to discipline myself daily to be in obedience to the Lord. It's a practice. Philippians 2, 12 through 13, Paul continues, Therefore, my beloved, beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now that word there in Greek is for work out. As he says, work out your own salvation is katagazomai. Which means to continually work to bring something to completion or fruition. It's a constant and continuous working at obedience and discipline to come into a life and live a life of holiness. So here we have it. Our biblical precepts for how to live out holiness, how to live a holy life day by day. We have to own it. We have to own our responsibility of holiness, our personal responsibility. We have to deny ourselves. We have to obey the word, the Holy Spirit, God himself. And we have to train in that. We have to, di- we have to discipline ourselves to do that every day, every hour. The more discipline, the more we see that we need to take more ownership, which allows us to deny ourselves more and be obedient and train and repeat and repeat and repeat. A disciple of Christ has discipline in holiness. We must discipline ourselves to be obedient daily, trained to be holy, trained to be righteous, trained for all God calls us to in his word. Training is a mindset of doing through being. Hebrews 12, 11 says, for the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been redeemed by it. Our last scripture here, which brings us to the beginning. We have been set free, set apart, redeemed, in order to be holy. Romans 6, 22. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. Now this week, I have some questions for you to ask yourself to enter into a conversation with the Lord. First question is, What is God telling you about your identity of holiness? I struggled with this question for myself because I kept coming back and like asking the Lord, who am I? And he just kept telling me, you're my holy son. You're my holy son. And the more he said it, the less I felt that. But I pushed in and I'm choosing to understand and believe who he has called me to be. The second question, where is God inviting you to own, deny, 
obey and or train holiness in your life. It takes, it takes some, some self-examination this week. And holiness is one of those things that we always feel less inclined to partake in because we feel like we're sinners and we feel like we're destitute and we feel less than holy. But God has made a way. He's granted us access to his holiness. Unfettered. It's a buffet table set before us. And all we have to do is get up and engage him in that. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much, Lord, for Lord, just um, allowing us to enter into a place of holiness, into your holiness, Lord. Thank you for giving us access through your Son that we might live out holy lives on this earth, Lord. We thank you for making it clear and concise for us, Lord. Lord, I pray for all of us who are, are struggling with an idea of, of living out our holiness, Lord. I pray that you would just continue to give us revelation, continue to speak to us, and continue to draw us deeper into a relationship with you and your Son, Lord, that we might see and live out holiness in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.